Hi everyone, welcome to our session, which is titled Evaluating Student Behavior and Outcomes in Online Testing. So to start off, we wanted to introduce who we are as the presenters of this session. We're from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. My name is Amy Zacek, so I'm the manager of the Digital Learning Center at UNL, and I've presented before at one of the EDUCAUSE ELI conferences back in 2017, and I've been in academic technologies here at UNL for over a decade. I recently received a Master of Arts in Education and I'm currently working toward my PhD. And so next I will let Jyotsna introduce herself. Hello everyone, uh, this is Jyotsna. Um, I am the Learning Analytics Analyst with uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln for about a year. Uh, I have a Master's degree uh, in Computer Science from UNL as well. Um, I have a background in software development um, and uh, currently I get to work with a lot of faculty members and data stewards trying to analyzing uh, students uh, exam behavior and how we can benefit uh, students and faculty members based on the students learning data. And this is my first time presenting at an EDUCOS conference, so I'm excited. All right, thank you, Jotsna. So just to provide a little bit of institutional context for UNL in case you're not familiar with our uni university. So we have approximately 25,000 uh, students in our student body, so very large institution. We are a uh, public R1 research institution and also um, the land grant university here in Nebraska. So um, as of fall 2019, our testing center had approximately 13,000 unique users. And as you can see from the student body stats up above, that means that we served over half of the student body in the testing center. So our, our service has a very large reach, right? So what is the Digital Learning Center? I've mentioned this a few times now. This is our large scale online testing center here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I'm just gonna provide some context before we get into the, the methodology of this study. So what are the benefits of this model? Just to start off, there are student, faculty, and organizational benefits that we've realized. As for students, students all reserve time slots to use our center. So it's not a traditional walk-in testing center, but all times are reserved. We're also located in uh, our campus's learning commons, which means that we're centrally located and that students can study here and then come take a test right in the same location. We also have lots of accommodation options for seating and a very spacious large design. Nice to not have a testing center recluse in a basement here on campus. So for faculty benefits, um, online testing makes the testing process much more easy for, for faculty members. So everything from test distribution to grading just takes a lot of workload off of them. Also gives back in class instruction time, which is very precious. Uh, faculty are, are, are also secure in the knowledge that they're sending their students to a secure environment with Respondus Lockdown browser, security cameras, and screen monitoring software. So finally, uh, this model is scalable and it's better than the previous decentralized approach that we had here at the university. We had um, several testing centers, all with different policies that uh, stakeholders had to familiarize themselves with. But now we're standardized to one. We only have um, one manager. We have one student staff. So um, that makes that easier and more cost efficient. And this center is also a good fit in our academic technologies IT unit. This testing center also has a homegrown reservation system, which was built by the UNL applications development team. So it was no small task. It took over 2000 um, application development hours to build. And there are more and more all the time as we realize things that we want to tweak and feature requests and upgrades. So this includes multiple pieces. It has a uh, faculty portal where instructors can go and submit their exam requests. There's a student portal where students sign up for time slots for those exams. And then there are also administrative pieces. So there is a student worker check-in check-out section of the site. There are administrative controls for me, the manager. And then there's even also a feature for the campus students for services with disabilities office. And so then I also mentioned the seating algorithm. So that's a custom developed piece of the website as well. When students come to check in for tests and we check them in, they are assigned a seat number. And that assignment is based on uh, an assortment of rules essentially that does um, the things on this list. So it will prevent students who are taking the same test from sitting next to each other, prevent students standing in line from uh, taking a test next to each other in the center thinking they might be friends, right? Um, we're also strategically filling the testing center to st seat students away from each other and to space them out. 
And so this is something that was built in the pre-pandemic era, but it has certainly helped us now in this climate of social distancing as well. And on that note, I will kick it over to Jotsna to talk about the methodology of what we did for the study. So yeah, moving on to the methodology of what we uh, did to carry out this uh, study, um, I wanted to talk uh, some of the points here. We are looking at actual human subject data uh, for the study. So we had to uh, get an IRB approval and that was done. And then uh, I wanted to kind of cover about the data set that we are looking at for this uh, study. Uh, the data set comes from two different data sources or data servers. Uh, the first data set is from the DLC server, that's the testing uh, center data, uh, which has in information such as the exam registrations, material information, students check in and check out time and so on. And uh, then we have the data set two, which is the system LMS data that is hosted on a UDP server. And uh, the LMS data has access to uh, the student's scores. Uh, so our goal is to combine the testing data and the student score data to kind of get our uh, uh, data pool, uh, which helps us uh, carry out the, the questions that we had uh, for this study. Uh, some of the challenges that we faced in uh, kind of the data collection phase is um, this uh, process was time, a little bit time consuming because the data sets uh, reside in different kinds of data servers. For example, the DLC data resides in an MS SQL server, whereas uh, the UDP data uh, resides in a Postgres SQL server. Uh, and we also had to uh, retrieve this information, clean them and de-identify them, and then put them together to, uh, to have our own uh, CSV data where we can carry out our tasks. And uh, another thing is uh, there, was, there, there isn't any common IE fields that uh, helps us join these two data together. So this kind of involved a little bit of time consuming manual process where we had to uh, make sure that the assignment titles or the exercise titles matched with whatever is there between the DLC data and the exam uh, score data on UDP. Uh, this kind of took a lot of cleaning time and this and finally this is fairly a new approach. There are no existing projects or uh, research topics that has kind of combined this kind of DLC data with uh, the actual students uh, score data to kind of see how the students have been performing or if any of these kinds of you know like the testing center is beneficial for the students or if it's serving its purpose. Uh, so since this hasn't been carried out in the past, uh, this, uh, and since, since this is most like a first timer, uh, all of these were kind of uh, challenging initially to kind of figure out what's the efficient way to do most of the data collection and data cleaning uh, for this study. So let's move on to the purpose of this research. And to talk about the purpose of this research, I'm going to pass it back to Amy. All right, thank you. So um, as... Um we've kind of implied the purpose of what we were seeking to do here was to combine all of that testing center data, which is so robust and has lots of different pieces to it with uh, the data from the Canvas UDP platform, right? So we want to see which testing center behaviors by the students, like for example, which days they signed up for, which seats they were assigned in the testing center, which times they signed up for, how that plays with the score that they get on their exams. So um, as you can see, we have some of those factors and behaviors listed below that we thought of that could possibly affect student outcomes. And those are factors that we will proceed to look at in the results of our study. So uh, here are some of our findings of our study um, and which we have put together as visualizations and let's discuss them. Uh, the first question is, uh, we wanted to look if a certain time of the day impacts the student's performance. Say uh, an exam is uh, supposed to happen um, on a certain days of the week and students register uh, for a certain hour of the day throughout the day. And uh, we wanted to see when was the most um, popular hour of the day when students signed up and how they scored uh, across uh, certain times of the day. And uh, to our surprise, uh, we kind of saw that when students signed up for exams in the afternoons, they scored uh, much better when compared to uh, when they signed up in the mornings or other times of the day. Uh, the, the graph in the bottom uh, shows a, a class level view of these uh, students and their percentage scores. 
uh, which kind of helps us to see like in different classes how how the, these students have been signing up for these exams and how have they been scoring on an average uh, in all of these courses on different times based on the different times of the day. Yeah, so the thing that surprised me most about these results, I thought the students in the morning, the early birds, would be likely to get the better better scores, but um, apparently students just need the, the energy of being in that kind of midday peak, you know, maybe right after lunch, after they have some fuel in them to, to perform um, well on exams. So that was a surprise to me. Um, yeah, so now uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is um, do materials uh, in exams help the students or not? And as we can see, uh, here is a distribution of the scores on different in different courses of these students. And uh, the green dots are the courses where uh, the materials were allowed, whereas the red dots are those courses where the materials weren't allowed. And as we can see, uh, the courses where the material was not allowed, we can see that in one of the courses, there's an upper whisker of 112%, and uh, a few other courses where the upper whisker is above 100%, which means that uh, some of the students have been going above and beyond of what is expected of them in these courses uh, when compared to those courses where uh, students were allowed to take materials to their exams. Both of them are uh, very close uh, in terms of the score average and the, and, and the median measures. Um, but uh, you can see that some of these courses are standing out when compared to other, other courses here. So I was really surprised to see that it seems that students do better on exams without materials. And I'd also like to note by, by materials, we mean a whole variety of things. This essentially is if instructors allow anything to be used on the test, which could range from note cards to note sheets to calculators or translators or rulers, you know, anything that students are allowed to bring in. I thought that those materials would help them do better, but maybe that it's maybe it's just a distraction during the testing process and that a student being able to think through their responses actually leads to better outcomes. So let's move on to the uh, next question um, in which we look into um, do early birth students benefit uh, from signing up early uh, when compared to those students who sign up uh, pretty late when compared to other groups um, of students. To answer this question, we group students um, in, into the following categories, such as early bird, last minute, late, and on time. Um, early bird students are students who kind of uh, signed up for these exams um, way ahead of the exam date, such as like maybe like 14 to 10 days before the exam. And uh, on time students are students who signed up somewhere between like 10 days to, uh, you know, like a one day before the exam. And we have the last minute students uh, who sign up uh, on the same day as the exam, maybe like a few hours before the exam. And we have late students who are pretty late for the exam, whereas they signed up uh, a few days later than the exam. Uh, and we wanted to see how these students scored in each of their exams, uh, depending on um, the time they uh, signed up for the, their exams. And uh, as you can see, uh, we can uh, it's evident that uh, the early birds uh, kind of scored um, higher when compared to other categories, uh, ranging about like uh, about around like a 72.2 percentage. And surprisingly, students who signed in the last minute, like a few hours before the exam, kind of scored the lowest, uh, which kind of uh, indicates they were probably stressed or something, and with which kind of affected their performance in their exam. And something to note here is uh, for this uh, study, we considered uh, about 10 courses, but with a little bit more time and resource, we should be able to extend this study uh, to a number of other courses and see how it goes on, on a large scale. Sure, well, my only comment here is that this, uh, this goes along with what I assumed originally, that the early birds, the students who sign up far in advance, um, they're the ones who are doing better. They're outperforming their peers. Uh, just because I, I think those behaviors probably also apply to studying, right? There's likely a correlation there uh, with the personality type of the student. Uh, they're more likely to be more prepared, invest more time in studying. So this one was not a surprise to me. So uh, moving on to the next question, we wanted to see how the seating arrangements uh, within the testing center affected the students' outcomes. And uh, we have a wide range of seating arrangements here for the students ranging from like standard to a private room. Uh, and it is evident from this graph here that the students who are given a private room uh, scored uh, way better on an average when compared to the standard uh, seating type. 
Uh, and we also have a seat type distribution, uh, which shows the percentage of number of times uh, students went for a specific kind of a seat type. And uh, most of the time students went for a uh, standard seat, seat type uh, when compared to other kinds of uh, seat types. And the graph in the bottom shows how the students' uh, seating position um, is impacting their outcome. This graph is helpful in a way because this is the actual uh, layout of our uh, testing center uh, seating guide. And uh, this helps us uh, kind of visualize actually uh, how uh, each of these uh, seating arrangements are helping or not helping the students or if they have to make some changes to their seating algorithm in the future to kind of um, improve their outcomes. Or the current algorithm is beneficial for these students to kind of score better in all of their exams. So I would just like to mention here, it's, it's really interesting, the, the wildly uh, more high scores for the students in the private rooms versus the standard seats. Um, that proves the, the effectiveness of a very, very distraction reduced environment, you know, and being beneficial to that testing experience, being able to concentrate and focus on the exam. So I, by all means, if, if uh, your institution has the money for private rooms with the new testing center, do it. I think that right here we've proven their value. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, not, not cost effective to have a testing center with all private rooms, though. We couldn't fit in many seats with that model, but um, I, I think it does work well. And then moving on to our uh, last and final question uh, on for this presentation is to look in, look at outcomes based on the exam length and how much time students took uh, for their on their exams. So we see here a graph that kind of shows a distribution of uh, the students uh, average percentage score and the time taken in on uh, those exams by those by the students and uh, these exams are categorized based on duration or the length of the exam itself, uh, which ranges from like 60 minutes, 75 minutes, uh, 90 minutes to 120 minutes. And uh, for each of these categories, we can see uh, how the distribution is then densely populated on certain parts of the graph along the X and Y axis. So if we specifically look into an exam of uh, 75 minutes long, the median time taken by the students to finish the finish a 75 minute exam was about 25 minutes and uh, of and those of a 120 minute exam the median was about uh, 60 minutes and uh, we can also compare uh, between uh, these exam durations and see that uh, when students are given an exam of a longer length of about 120 minutes uh, we see uh, some of the outliers here um, somewhere way beyond 120 minutes uh, on an average. Uh, whereas when you go to like a 60 minute or a 75 minute exam, we don't see a lot of outliers as compared to um, those in, on, the, on the upper scale, uh, which kind of conveys that um, having an, a longer lengthy duration of exams kind of uh, impacts the students in a way, maybe uh, in terms of the time they take to complete the exam maybe um, because they might be thinking that they have a lot of time to finish the exam whereas they're kind of uh, lagging behind uh, on their time. This kind of conveys that um, conveys that uh, when students are given a lot of time, uh, they, they kind of feel that they have a lot of time for, to finish the exam whereas they are lagging behind or something is making them slower uh, to finish the exam. So I just think it's interesting that the students with the 75 minute exam duration are the ones with the highest scores in, uh, in these graphs. Uh, but on the other hand, that could just be due to the smaller sample size of that test time, because not a lot of instructors submit exams that are 75 minutes long, right? So um, we could just be looking at one or two tests here that were particularly easy for students or something to that effect. But it would be interesting to to do this study with um, a larger, you know, data set and to be able to truly, truly see with that larger amount of data. I feel like that would be more of a generalizable result. So now that we have discussed uh, some of these questions, um, I'm sure that uh, all of you are going to have uh, your own perspectives and we would love to hear from you if you had more ideas and more suggestions based on all these visualizations that we just presented to you. And now moving on to uh, the outcomes and recommendations, I'm gonna pass it on to Amy to talk about uh, some of the uh, recommendations that she would like to uh, give you all. Thank you. So, and I know we're getting close on our time and I'm gonna wrap this up as quick as possible. 
So, so some outcomes from this data, I would love to be able to provide students with tips based off of what we found. So for example, hey, students, guess what? If you sign up for those afternoon time slots, that's correlated with higher test times. Or if you sign up earlier in the test period, that's correlated with higher, um, higher exam scores, right? Uh, however, some of that, the variables that we looked at are not within student control, right? So I mentioned with our seat algorithm, students don't choose their seat, they're assigned a seat. They don't have a lot of say there, or even with um, test length or materials, that's up to the instructor, right? But even some of those things that are controlled by instructors or us, maybe those are um, tips for student success that we can pass on to instructors or that we could tweak our business processes uh, toward student advantage. And so then um, after viewing this presentation, a few recommendations for you as a peer institution came out of this. So uh, clearly there are benefits to having your own online testing center. There are also benefits to maintaining robust data sets. So if you do have, get a testing center, I would recommend you collect this data so that you can do similar cool research. Uh, the UDP data was also immensely helpful to this. So for that matter, uh, I would love to pursue possible peer uh, collaborations with this research, with this type of data in the future. So please let me know if you're interested in doing some sort of um, peer study on testing data. So that kind of brings me to future work. So I've listed a few ideas that we've had for other possible ways to look at these two data sets. So comparing outcomes of the same classes that are online classes versus their um, in-person class, you know, duplicates looking at what happens to scores if students miss their time slots and others as well. Uh, but these are all things that we can, we can adventure into going forward. This shows our contact information. So my email address is listed as well as Jotsna's. You're welcome to reach out to uh, both of us or just one of us if uh, you have specific questions and we would love to continue this conversation uh, after EDUCAUSE. So thank you all so much for attending.